Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Strategizer Strat Chat webinar. We'll be starting in just a minute. We just want to take a few moments to think about what you might want to get out of today's session. And if at any time you have questions during the webinar, please feel free to use the Zoom chat box and we'll try to get to your questions uh, throughout the webinar. So I think we can get started. Welcome again, everyone, to today's Strat Chat webinar. Today's session is about testing business ideas. I'm Lauren Cantor, I'm your moderator. I run the content studio at Strategizer. Our host today is Alex Osterwalder. He's the co-founder of Strategizer. And our guest is David Bland. He's a founder, author, and innovation coach. And Alex and David are working on our next book in the Strategizer series called Testing Business Ideas. And throughout the session, if you want to, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Zoom chat. And no need to take any notes. Uh, record this webinar. We'll be sending out the session later this week. So with that, I'll pass it over to Alex and David. Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for joining Alex. So yeah, we're really excited to talk about our upcoming book, Testing Business Ideas, that's going to be out this fall. And I just want to share some content with you all and start a conversation. And uh, we're really excited about it. So we wanted to get uh, everybody involved. So um, the first thing is, how do I reduce risk in my business idea? We keep hearing that time and time again. I know Alex hears that all the time. Uh, people want to create something new, whether it's a startup or a corporation, and we're trying to go into kind of an unknown, right? So it's not a known market, and we're trying to figure out, you know, what is this market? Can we deliver this? You know, is there a business model there? Can we generate more revenue than cost? And are there infrastructure, you know, concerns as far as we can support this? And I hear it a lot at the team level. And Alex, I'm curious, do you, do you hear this at the, the exec level? Or what, what do you hear out in the world when you're, uh, when you're consulting on this stuff? Absolutely. And I think the, the, the good thing is the way you framed it. How do I reduce risk in my business idea? Because often people think about building stuff, right? Um, I have this idea. I'm just going to build a smaller version of it. And if you frame it this way, well, let's see what the risk is. How risky is this idea? You know, what needs to be true for this idea to work? And then you break it down into smaller chunks, into these hypotheses. You can manage it in a very different way. So um, I really think this idea of risk, um, framing it in terms of risk and smaller chunks that you can, can uh, test resonates a lot. And I'm super curious uh, to, uh, to uh, see what you're going to present and have a conversation about this because working with you on, the, on this next book has been pretty fun. Yeah, yeah. So I do think there is an element of risk in the sense of uh, it's just too big to think about. Like, will we succeed or will people buy it? You know, and granted, those are risks, but you need to be able to break it down. And so what we've been working on together has been, you know, this uh, essentially a library and a field guide for experimentation. And uh, it's went through several iterations and it's based on uh, almost like 10 years of experience helping companies do this. And, you know, over time, um, trying to figure out how to make this actionable for people when they say, okay, I want to reduce risk, but I'm not really sure what's available. And, you know, if you only have, you know, one tool in your toolbox, let's say, you know, or three tools, you know, usually it's landing page and surveys and interviews, that's going to help you reduce some risk, you know, but it's usually mostly desirability risk. And then what else is even available? Um, and, and some people don't know. And so we kind of do a landing page and then it's, well, now what? And there's a bunch of things out there that you can do. And I think uh, just giving people something actionable is, um, it's almost like giving you superpowers, right? So you can choose what, okay, what's available to me when I have this type of risk? And it's like, oh, there's all this stuff available to me. How can I, how can I run those and help feel better about my path versus uh, only going back to the same ones over and over again? Because, you know, you'll might, you might be completing experiments and that might feel like progress, and, but it's very dangerous because it's not necessarily progress tied to your riskiest assumption. So this quick, is quick question, David, can I ask you a quick question? Because this library is really complete, right? There's a, there's a whole series of things that you can do beyond surveys, beyond landing pages, beyond interviews, which are kind of the go-to things or, or then building something. Were you surprised when we formalized this into you know, all different types of experiments, how many we ended up with? I, I am, and I'm also um, 
surprised at how the strength of evidence kind of played out. So for example, I, I made some assumptions even going in and I've been doing this a while, which was, um, I had, I kind of had a feeling that when we're doing discovery work and open-ended, the, the evidence is usually a little, a little weaker. Um, and it really played out when we started categorizing things when we're doing something, we call them validation experiments in the, in the book, but when we're doing things, we're putting something out in the world and people are responding to it and there's a real value exchange. You know, you could just see there on the right, the evidence strength is kind of off the charts, you know, because if you are delivering value and even if it's manually, right, you're, you're kind of testing it end to end and people are paying for it. But when you're doing, you know, things like surveys and interviews, um, you still need to do those, but the evidence strength is weak. So I think um, I kind of felt that with the teams I was advising over the years, but I always try to prevent them from, let's say, let's do some interviews and then let's build a whole app or a whole product. And because you're going from this weak evidence strength to something that's really high fidelity that costs a lot of money. And if you get it wrong, it's really hard to recover from. And, you know, I, I always try to get to incrementally go through it. And I think it was really telling for me. Um, the other point about evidence strength that was a big learning aha for me, and, and Alex, um, you can chime in here too, which was, you know, you can't, it's not an overall evidence strength sometimes. So even if you did something like a landing page, if you're asking for email, that's relatively weak because anybody gives out their email now. And so it's not, it's some currency, but it's really weak, you know? And, uh, but if you're asking for payment information, that's really strong because they're giving up payment information for something. So even in the gradation of like variants of an experiment itself, there are different nuances to, to strength. So that was probably one of the biggest learnings for me was when we went through categorizing these. Yeah, one of the things that actually helped me do when we were working on the book and this, this idea of um, strength of evidence, you know, it was also answering some questions and realizing, well, you can test the exactly the same hypothesis, right? Willingness to pay with different levels of, of, of strength of evidence. You use an experiment, like an interview, and they, people say, yeah, of course, I'm going to pay that. I have a budget. That's relatively weak evidence, so it's a quote. But then the exact same hypothesis that they're willing to pay for something, maybe even a specific price, you can get stronger and stronger evidence. So you're basically working on the same hypothesis, willingness to pay, but your experiment gets more and more complex, if you want, with your certainty and the strengths, the, the evidence gets stronger and stronger. First, you had a quote from an interview, then you might collect some emails, and then you go to simulated purchases, right? Which seems trivial, but actually when, when, when I look at teams, they're not as you know, sophisticated as that, seeing that they can test the exact same hypothesis with several things. They might just do a, you know, a, a landing page and that's it. So that was a big eye opener for me as well. And then connecting that with the library has been brilliant. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that I hear time and time again when I'm working with teams all around the world is, um, you know, oh, is this a one-to-many thing? Like one hypothesis to many experiments? Because <laughs> I think they, they feel like it's a one-to-one. -one. I have a hypothesis, I run an experiment, I give a thumbs up and I move on. And and it takes a little more rigor than that, right? You have to try different things. And you're, are you really, you know, proving or refuting this thing basing off one experiment? Typically not. I've never really worked with a team that just ran one experiment and then uncovered millions of dollars and was super successful. <laughs> it's always this winding path of, you know, what are the different things I could do? So David, so before we move on, before we move on to the first experiment, there's somebody asking, and this is a good question, could you explain, you know, how do you measure strategic risk? So just breaking it down maybe in the three risk categories that we have in the book might, might, might be a bit clearer for people uh, before we get started. Sure, yeah. So uh, there are three major themes that we use. And Alex, you have uh, more too. But for the book, we're focusing on uh, desirability, which is if you look at the canvas, it's really about the value proposition, um, your customer relationships, your channel, and your customer segment. So think of that kind of top right you know, corner of your canvas. For uh, viability, we're looking at uh, revenue and costs. So think of the bottom of your canvas, those two boxes. And then for feasibility, we're, we're going beyond just technical feasibility and we're talking about, do you have the right infrastructures? So that's key activities, key resources, and key partners. So are you able to kind of deliver on that strategic risk? And then also the value prop canvas, which is pretty much all desirability, right? So your customer profile and your value prop zoomed in. So when we're framing strategic risk for this book, we're very much talking about do people want this? You know, is there a market need, which is all desirability? We're talking about, um, you know, is, there, is this a viable business in viability? And then we're talking about, can we support the infrastructure for this to, to create this business, which is very much feasibility? Can we, can we deliver? 
And I think it's important to point this out, right? Because, you know, sometimes people, they just build a smaller version of their, their idea of the product, actually. And, and this is not about product alone. It's really, you know, the, what we want people to think about is we're testing a business. We're testing a new growth engine. We're not just an R&D lab testing if we can make a product, right? So that's the big thing. And we're not just testing if the market wants it. We want to know, can we create real business growth financially around this? And that, that includes an entire business model from the start. So there's this, you know, belief. Sometimes people say, oh, startups, they just need to test the product. That's BS. Because if you just, you know, you can, I can build a successful product for you tomorrow um, if, if I, you know, can spend all the money of the world. It's really about creating something that creates value for customers, but is also, you know, embedded in, in a scalable business model. And this is a, I'm curious, um, before we go into this first experiment, because I think it's a good one to show this, David, I'm sure you've seen teams that forgot that it's about building a growth engine, a business model, and not just a, a product, right? And then it failed once they validated the product, but they couldn't turn it into a business. Yeah, I think um, most of our experimentation knowledge out there has been purely focused on user research and product experimentation. And so I'm always taken back when I'm working with teams and, and it, the, the light bulbs go off and they, and they say, oh, wow, I can, I can experiment on the back end of this business. I can actually experiment my way through, you know, can we do this and, and how we make money on this. And I think um, that's why the, we, we kind of felt the need for something like this book, which was there, there's a gap in knowledge out there in the market of holistic experimentation around your business. And you can successfully kind of do user research and desirability experimentation, but then you still might fail because you can't support the infrastructure or you get the price points wrong. And I think, um, I don't know, I think some people have anxiety around testing with price, but you can really do it in an ethical way um, and, and do it to maximize your price point. But I just, yeah, it's really interesting to me how I feel like all the, all the knowledge out there is around kind of user research and desirability testing. Okay, let's get started with this Wizard of Oz, right? Some, some of the experts know this, um, but um, probably not an experiment that is used a lot, Might, probably the most underused experiment. Yeah, you know, one of the things, so Wizard of Oz has been out there for a while, and it's basically you're kind of creating and delivering the, the value manually, um, kind of like in the movie, right? But basically, uh, and unlike concierge, where concierge is um, similar, but it's obvious someone's involved. So there's, a, there's this more like a concierge service where the people are visible. And when we started breaking this down, I realized, one, not a lot of people do this. I think it's one of the most underutilized experiments out there, and it generates almost uh, the most learning. And I think it's just because people have a hard time, like, how do I break this down, and, and what does it look like? And so what we started doing is kind of breaking it down for you and saying, Okay, so what is this test? Well, it tests like all three themes. Uh, and that's something that we really um, understood pretty early on in the book writing process was it's not that these three themes are in isolation and it's not that um, there's one experiment per theme. A lot of these kind of span all three. So if you're like receiving orders and manually creating value and delivering it and they're paying for it, that's all three themes, right? You're, you're really doing all three and it's... Um, it doesn't scale, so it's not ideal for scaling, but it's great early on learning for uh, figuring out, you know, is this, real, this value exchange real? And so when you start breaking that down, you look at cost, and for the most of the part, you know, because you're doing this manually, cost is not, um, not really high with regards to something like this. You can keep costs low because you're doing it manually. Again, you're not doing it at scale, so you don't have to worry about scaling, you know, people and, and all that. So it's basically pretty cheap to do this. Um, and it generates a lot of evidence strength. So out of all the experiments, like this is one of the stronger ones because there's a real value exchange there and you're testing out the back end, you know, can we, can we deliver this? And then when you start breaking down the setup time and the runtime, yeah, it takes a little longer to set up and maybe it, you run it a little longer, but it's not something that should take you months, right? It's something that you can kind of spin up if you're at this point in your process, you kind of you've ran some lower fidelity experiments and cheaper experiments to inform this kind of bigger one where you design the end-to-end -end process. And then for the capabilities, you're gonna need, you know, almost, if it's not, uh, it doesn't have to be all separate people, but you're gonna need, you know, design, product, technology, legal, marketing, you're gonna need, need to be able to kind of deliver the value, right? And um, if you skimp on one of these too much, you know, let's say you do, don't have any design. Well, if the design isn't at the right, believability, right, you're not delivering value that's, that's usable and viable, then, um, then it's going to fail. So 
we give some advice and deeper explanation in the book, but basically you need to be able to kind of pull together the right kind of capabilities if it's just you or if it's a team to kind of um, run through Wizard of Oz in a way where you can deliver value and receive value and, and generate the kind of evidence you need. So, so I like um, this a lot. Quick question, um, David. So, so we did this right for 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 all of the different experiments. What was one of the biggest surprises, you know, when when for you when we broke it down down into runtime, evidence strength, setup time, cost, and the capabilities? Did anything kind of surprise you when when you systematically went through these experiments? I think for capabilities specifically. Um, you know, I always recommend cross-functional teams. So I say product design, engineering, that's what you need, that's what you start with. And I think as I really dug in, and, and that does cover most of your bases, right? But it doesn't always cover things like legal, marketing, some of the, some of the things that might not feel like they're core to you, but they need to be in a good shape for you to be successful when you run your experiment. So I think that was one of the learnings for me going through and breaking these down was, you know, Product design engineering is a great starting point, but I think it's almost like we need to evolve our definition of cross-functional team to be everything that we need to ship and learn in the market and de-risk our business. And for that, for you, if it's hardware, you know, you're going to need, you know, hardware design, you're going to need like industrial design, you're going to need hardware engineers, you're going to need to be able to, you know, for your context, pull that together. If you're doing software, it's a little different, right? You have software design and, and engineering, but for the legality part of, you know, if you're in a heavily regulated environment, there's some things you can and can't do, so you need to consult legal. Uh, for marketing, I mean, it's a great thing to say, I'm gonna have a Wizard of Oz, you know, I'm gonna run this. But if you don't have any people, <laughs> they don't know about it, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna succeed just because you didn't have attention. So you can't neglect something like marketing. So I think for me, the capability section kind of jumped out. Um, in addition to, you know, not one experiment per theme, which I, um, I think naively maybe walked into this feeling like that. That's like a nice clean break and that's how this would all shake out. But in reality, they overlap themes. Cool, cool. We have an example for this one, right? Uh, we do. So um, I want to kind of break down a little bit more of kind of what some of the insights you're going to get from the book are on doing something like Wizard of Oz. So again, behind the curtain, the stuff's going on. It's not always visible to the, to the customer, right? So it's kind of, it could be a physical curtain or a digital curtain, uh, whether it's software or, or hardware. And the idea of like, okay, we need to prepare for this experiment. I think so many experiments are ad hoc and we just kind of do them, right? There's some initiative, we get excited about it and we just run off and do them. But if you're doing something like a Wizard of Oz, you know, plan it out. What are all the steps I need to do to kind of receive an order and process that and give it back to a customer and, and receive you know, payment for it? Uh, have a board, have some way to track it. If it's offline, literally just have a board on the wall where you're tracking the steps. Um, if it's software, you know, have a, a board up where you can track the steps and just basically make sure you have, you know, it's not completely ad hoc. It's, it's something that you've planned out and you can track and measure. And then when you execute it, you know, uh, update, update your board as you go along, document how long it takes to complete things, um, do customer satisfaction interviews, surveys, CSAT, you know, try to try to get qualitative feedback as well from the customer to see, is this the right, you know, viable, kind of level of, of fidelity for, for what your Wizard of Oz is trying to learn. And then take the time to analyze all the results. You know, did people actually find the value? How long did it take us? How costly was it? Um, where were their delays, right? Are there blockers in your process where you have to figure out, hey, before we operationalize this and we want to scale it, this could be a, a killer for our entire business if we don't kind of solve this. Um, and kind of use all that learning manually delivering value to help inform your automation if you plan to go forward and scale it. And, you know, the biggest pushback I get on this when I talk to people is like, well, I don't have the time. You know, I don't have the time to do something like this manually. And but it's kind of crazy when you think about it, you know, it's like, oh, I don't have time to go through this, but I have the time to scale it to an infinite amount of customers and crazy. not know where the risks are. <laughs> you know, so you have to make time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for the example, uh, I'll get to that, but basically uh, for the pairings, I also, uh, we give um, some example for some examples of like how you would pair customer uh, or how you pair experiments together. So for example, on this one, we could say, well, you're running a Wizard of Oz, what goes well with that? It's almost like a menu. And it's like, well, you can have a feature stub. A feature stub is something on your website or you know, digitally where they click and it's not ready yet, but if they sign up, 
you can deliver the value manually to them, not at scale, but if they're that interested without building out the whole product, you can use something like a feature stub. Another thing you can do is a brochure. This is really easy, especially for service or um, other products where you can literally have a brochure and there's a call to action on it. And if they call, you manually behind the scenes deliver the value to, to the customer. And then obviously one of the ones that are more popular is something like a landing page. And um, I think people maybe, uh, I know it's a really popular kind of experiment, but the idea of if they submit an order digitally, you can behind this digital curtain create value and send it back to them and they really don't know it wasn't software, right? So there, you can really use landing pages to your advantage that way too, if you're not further along. Um, for existing product, I would do something like a feature stub, but for a landing page, it's something you know kind of new. And then afterwards, um, there are other things you could do, right? You could do some kind of mashup MVP where you take parts of what you learned and automate it with existing tech, so it starts to scale, but you don't overinvest in it. You could do things like referral programs where you have, you know, hey, do you really love this experience? Can you refer a friend, right? And there's something you could test around um, kind of virality and in kind of engine of um, growth there. And then you could do something like crowdfunding, right? So if you know people really want this, can you crowdfund it to, um, you know, to drive to drive uh, to more demand? And and basically. You know, it's not an experiment in isolation, you know, um, and then we've laid this out into sequences too, which are much longer in the book. But the idea of it's not in isolation, there's stuff feeding into this experiment that we've done before that we've learned and there's stuff coming after this that we can do. And I think that's another one of the bigger learnings for me working with teams is that um, it's really hard to make this repeatable and they're not sure what comes next or what should I be doing before this. So uh, for the example is a fun one that we have in the book from uh, topology. And so um, basically they have augmented reality for, um, for glasses and they customize and measure your face. And then basically they're able to customize glasses and ship them to you. So it's really, really cool tech and also kind of a blend of software and, and hardware. But they started off as a pop-up store, <laughs> which I think is a fascinating story, right? So a pop-up store in San Francisco, they said, look, uh, so a pop-up store is basically, you know, a temporary, uh, store that you use to kind of sell, but you can also use it to validate and, and, and to learn and discover. And, you know, they just wanted to find out, hey, before we expend all this um, capital in, uh, in developing this whole solution, like, are people aware of this? And are they even willing to have some kind of high-tech approach to the solution? And so the experiment is they created a pop-up store and they you know, intercepted people on the streets. They would talk about their, you know, uh, the fit of their glasses, you know, the people that were really interested, they kind of guided them into the store. And then, um, you know, they really had kind of low expectations, but, you know, they were trying to not get too excited about it. But after two hours, they sold four pairs, you know, at an average of about $400. And while that was interesting evidence for them, um, I think the big learning for them, the insights um, based on speaking to them was, you know, the qualitative insights were even the more valuable than the, the sales. So, you know, the idea of what exactly was, you know, they were kind of symptom aware of what, but they weren't really sure what problem, you know, what was causing the problems on their face and why it wasn't fitting. And the idea of like, oh, this is how we need to dial into this specific problem because they kind of understand it a little bit, the symptoms, but they don't really understand the overall, uh, overarching problem to why their glasses, why their glasses don't fit. And then they kind of use this pop-up store. Um, they ran other pop-up stores. Um, they kind of use this to inform the you know their landing page you know the text on their landing page come from a lot of those great customer quotes and the interviews they conducted in their store and so they're able to kind of generate all this learning from a relatively short time box experiment where you know there was a value exchanger in the sense of you know granted they didn't have all the all the product available yet it was kind of behind glass so they weren't necessarily handing pairs over but the idea of, while well, people are going to give us their email to sign up, they're really interested, people are willing to pay, they're willing to give us feedback into what the actual problem is. You know, things like this, I feel like you can be really creative and tap into your team's creativity and, you know, do something fun that also will help you learn and de-risk um, de your business idea. I like what you just said about creativity, right? Because we put all the creativity on ideation and whatnot. But, but the point is that we should probably be a bit more creative in, in how we test our ideas in the whole series of experiments that we do. And I think this, uh, here we have some good examples of creative experiments. I think the creativity for testing is underrated. I'd say that's actually the hardest part, right? So go beyond interviews and surveys and landing pages to really get some very strong evidence for create, creative one uh, experiments. And in particular in highly regulated industries, right? You can't just do landing pages, it doesn't make a lot of sense. 
So creativity is, is underrated when it comes to testing. Right. And we have other examples in the book too that are not, you know, the, they're more kind of tailored to B2B and to hardware and to regulated. And we have some sequences that we've laid out for those industries because we do work with those industries. And I think overall, it's just, um, I, I think you're exactly right. The ideation seems like, well, that's where the greater creativity happens. No, I mean, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's one part of where the creativity is one place, but there's so many things you could do when it's like, we need to learn this. How are we going to learn this? And if you can just pair that up with a series of things that are available to you, it's pretty amazing what teams can come up with and they come up with like much more creative things than even I could come up with. And I've seen a lot of different, uh, different opportunities out there. So it's really, really cool and see them get excited about it and feel like, all right, I'm going to learn about this before I just go off and build it because I'm really worried because we've all built something that nobody cared about probably in our career. And it's just a terrible experience. And so the idea of I can use my creativity to help de-risk something I think is really powerful. I love the way you framed it, right? That creativity, we, we believe it happens in one place, but it actually happens throughout. It's awesome. Lauren, um, you've been following the questions. Any questions you would want to highlight for uh, David and myself? David, I think people are curious as to what you think um, the difference between startups and corporations and even B2B or services industries. Are there different considerations you need to take when um, picking an experiment and conducting the experiments? Yeah, I see there's probably more overlap than people realize um, because I do work with both or many. So, for example, um, I see a lot of the practices startups use are also the same practices corporations use. It's just a little different context. So we do give some advice in the book on things that you're probably worried about if you're a corporation. Uh, number one thing is brand. That seems to be, you know, I work with companies where their brand is over 100 years old. And so everything's about the brand. And I think um, in a way that almost um, that culture creates this behavior where we can't release anything unless it's fully polished. It's better than perfect because we can't damage the brand. And if you notice, there are a lot of, ki- there are a lot of companies that are addressing that by kind of sidestepping the process a little bit by saying we're going to create a sub brand or an off brand or we're going to create a new company to just test this idea to see if it works. And then we can bring it on brand or we can kill it if it doesn't work. And so, you know, when you search online and you see all these different, um, there's a lot of Indiegogo campaigns that are branded this way, a lot of Kickstarter campaigns, a lot of landing pages, a lot of things are digitally out there where people, you know, they're not necessarily bleeding with the brand. Um, If you trace it back, you can see, oh, okay, this is powered by such and such. But the brand isn't something that should stop you, right? It shouldn't stop this behavior just because you're afraid of not putting something out there that isn't perfect. So that's you know, that kind of context we're putting in the book as far as, look, if you're at a corporation, your, your rules are a little different, but they may be more similar than you realize as far as what's available to you. It's just, you have to do it within the constraints of the system. Uh, whereas a startup doesn't have those constraints because uh, there are constraints more around you know, resources and money, but not so much about you know, their brand because they really don't have one yet. So yeah, we, in the book, we uh, try to lay that out for teams to give them some advice. Yeah, I would add one thing that, uh, as a difference. Um, you know, Steve Blank often mentions this one that startups can break the law. <laughs> they shouldn't, and they might go to jail for that, but, um, and, and corporations can't, right? So you want to get your legal department involved as early as possible, not afterwards. You want them as allies, right? So I think the, the, the best companies we see, they actually have lawyers who help the teams with uh, designing experiments and not just in pharma where it's just mandatory, right? But also in other, in other areas. So if you don't have legal on your side, they're just going to come knock on your door and shut you down. So you want to make sure um, as an individual team that you, you get their buy-in upfront as much as possible. And if you're a company that's already a little bit advanced, you actually want a legal team that is here just to do that. In particular in Europe now, right? With, uh, with uh, the whole uh, um, GDPR uh, where you need to make sure you treat the customer data right, um, so otherwise you have a problem, you really want to get the legal team involved as an ally. I think that's a big one, a big difference that, that, that we should point out. Uh, Lauren, any other questions? I have one that, that came up, but I want to see if there's anything you want to highlight first. Sure. Uh, David, I think people are curious. You hadn't, um, I know in the book covers a lot of different metrics for measuring experiments, but I don't know if you want to go through the pop-up store or um with any of the experiments you've already shown about what actual metrics you would use to measure the risk? Oh yeah, I, I don't have them in the stack, but basically in the book we have, um, we give recommendations on specific um, measurements per experiment. So um, things like, um, 
basically like cycle time. So I talked about a little about Wizard of Oz. I dived into that, I dove in a little bit where we talked about, you know, how long did it take you to complete the task? Where were you blocked? You know, what was customer satisfaction? So for each um, experiment type, we kind of break it down into specific things and, and uh, serve that up. So that that is in the book. We do um, give guidance. And then we have um, a strength indicator on each type. So like I said, you know, if people are saying things to you, like at the pop-up store, if they're giving you good feedback verbally, that's relatively weak. I mean, even if it's great qualitatively and you might use it uh, later, it's relatively weak evidence because they're just saying, right? But if they're purchasing, it's really strong. So that's stronger sense of evidence. So yeah, in, in each experiment type, we have that broken out as separate spreads. So I'd, I'd like to make a quick comment about one of the questions. If we can go back quickly to the Wizard of Oz, right? Somebody was, was mentioning Oh, um, Wizard of Oz, maybe you just want to put up this slide very quickly um, of the, you know, with the curtain. Somebody was saying, yeah, but this looks like it's more for low, you know, investment products. I think it's actually quite the contrary. <laughs> where it costs a lot to build a system or to scale a system, that's exactly where you want to use uh, the Wizard of Oz, right? Because you're basically not going to um, um, build the entire system but the customer still feels like he's, you know, dealing with the real thing. But behind the scenes, you're doing things manually. So I think actually Wizard of Oz is a very, very good one, a uh, very, very good experiment for, um, for um, 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 platforms and products where the investment cost is very high. So after interviews, you might go to something like Wizard of Oz to get stronger evidence than just the, the interviews. So a lot of companies, you know, that we work with, they say, yeah, but it's going to cost me a million dollars just to make a first prototype. That's exactly the, the, the type of place where you want to be creative and use Wizard of Oz. And generally, I'm curious about what you think, David. Um, I, I see a lack of creativity and, and still you get them started. Once they've, they've, they've done it once and came up with the creative experiments, the floodgates kind of, you know, are open. But before that, they, they always feel like they need to build this expensive thing. So um, what's your experience, experience with, with this also in, in relationship, you know, to um, um, industries where the investments are pretty uh, big up front. So you want to look at different kinds of experiments. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it depends on your context, but so one of the companies I work with out here in the Silicon Valley, you know, we were building mobile apps and they're really successful mobile apps. But before we got to the app, we did a wizard of Oz where we had a landing page and people submitted what they wanted. We manually designed them with a designer on the back and sent it back and gauged viability in regards to, was this the right quality is what they asked for? Um, did they use it the way we thought? Because it's for social media and it's for social media managers. And um, to learn, you know, and so we used all that learning pretty early on in doing it manually without them knowing a person was designing it and use that to design the actual application. So, you know, when you think of how apps are designed today, you know, uh, the UI is really, the UX is really important. So if you have too many things in there, it could, um, it could be just too confusing for people and it'll fail that way really expensively. And so what we learned was, you know, people only care about a couple things. And if we actually added all these other features we wanted, they don't even use them. They wouldn't want them. So we used what we did manually to help inform the app. And I won't name the app, but it's one of the five star rated uh, apps on the app store. And it's used by hundreds of thousands of people. And, but it had been really expensive to build that in a way where we added all the bells and whistles that people didn't need. So we use Wizard of Oz in that case to kind of learn what do people really care about. And then we tailored our design to that. So we already had some evidence. It wasn't just sitting in a room going, wouldn't it be cool if, and uh, that's a really dangerous phrase, as my friend Jeff Goffnoff says, uh, in software development. So uh, you don't want to stack it up with a bunch of wouldn't it be cool ifs. You know, you want to have some evidence to say, is there really a demand here? And so in that way is it can help you really from making a million dollar mistake. Uh, Lauren, I, I think you've seen a couple of questions that, you know, going in one direction or another. So we have, we have people with completely diverging opinions, right? 180 degrees differences. What, what are some of those things that came up? Sure. David, people are asking about um, the, a lot of the topics we've discussed are about business model innovation um, or focus on business model innovation rather than product innovation. And then some are asking how you would use um, the testing for services. So um, a focus on products versus services. Yeah. So I'll answer a couple of this. So basically product is part of this, but it's not all of it, right? So 
Um, there is some product experimentation in the book in stuff that you can use for product experimentation, but keep it in context of the overall business model. So over like the book is focused on testing business ideas and your product or service is going to be part of that business idea. So it is a core part, but it's not the only thing. So we do address that in the book and then services in some ways, um, though they might be easier to, to test, right? So I don't have all the experiment types here laid out for you today, obviously, but concierge things where you just do things really hands-on early to get the learning you need before you scale services, because sometimes services are gonna be more people and, and money, right, and hours. Um, so there are techniques that you can use for services uh, in the book as well. And David, what about for projects that might be in existing companies that tend to have um, long timeframes that maybe there's, um, you know, it takes a lot of infrastructure to build. Is there a better test for that? Well, I mentioned it slightly on this one with the feature stub. So companies like Google do this all the time, right? Where it's like, this is a feature that's not available yet. And it's quick test. It doesn't mean you base your entire decision off the test, but it is a point of evidence on whether or not we should build this thing or not. And so you can do that with pretty standard technology today. Uh, fast, you don't really need a dev team. You can just literally paste something in and have a dashboard, right, with some of the product offerings today. And so there are ways in an existing company where the learning loops are really long to get learning faster. And I think that was one of the big ahas for me working with teams was, you know, I, I hear back from product managers, well, we can't wait this long to learn. And one, I loved hearing that because, wow, they have this like hunger for learning and we need to learn faster and it's not tough, like coupled to our release cycles. But two, like what are, then I got kind of curious, like what are the options out there available that would help us shorten that learning loop? And the good news for you, and we'll do this digitally after the book as well and have a page for you, but you know, what are the resources available to me? If I'm tied to these long release cycles, how can I get the learning faster? What are some products and services that let me do that? So um, things like feature subs are more for, you know, I want to test a feature or uh, an option that's something existing and do it quickly and get the learning I need. Yeah, I'd like to add to that, that one because there's this common myth, again, and I'm, I'm repeating myself, but that we need to build something literally a smaller product of the thing to, to actually find evidence and learn, right? So if you are in an industry with very long product development cycles and heavy investments, that's a reason more to be insanely obsessive with testing before you put anything into feasibility, right? So when, when, the, when the cycles are long, you need to be really, really sure about jobs, pains, and gains of your customers. You need to be, you know, really have very strong data in terms of what is the most important job, pain, or gain. Because often, you know, when I hear um, people saying, oh, we know our customer really well, and you start asking questions, you, you ask for evidence. Why do they know that this job is more important than that job to be done? Why do they know that this pain is, is bigger than that pain? And they usually fall apart. They don't have the evidence to say that, right? So. I think in particular in, in industries with long you know, um, cycles and very heavy investments, that's exactly the place where you want to be obsessed with getting the jobs, pains, and gains right before you, you put a single dollar into feasibility, before you put a single dollar into building. And I think one of the attractive things that you know, I found really amazing working with David on this book is that there's a whole series of experiments that you can do beyond the interview to start to understand customers well before you go into building stuff, right? So I think this one, I get a bit passionate about it because I see way too many mistakes of people starting to build much too fast. Yeah, I agree. Um, I work a lot with the automotive industry and have in the past. And you know, depending on who you ask, the cycle time on a car from idea to production is about six to seven years. And think of the investment. See, just hold up your phone and imagine what that looked like six to seven years ago. Your phone looked very different, right? <laughs> uh, I think, I don't know what I was using, maybe a Motorola Razor, maybe, <laughs> I'm not sure. But the idea of, you know, if that's a pace of technology change and you're trying to, to validate something like a vehicle, an automotive, it, you know, some of these techniques can help. And, and that's what I do. I help automotive companies figure out, you know, what's the need for this thing before we actually invest in it? Because, you know, integrate it in the car with all the infrastructure and then all your point of sale contacts, all this other stuff. It could be really, especially around anything like connected car or autonomous. A good um, example, a good example of that, just while you're talking about it, um, the, the Porsche Cayenne was conceived with that in mind. They actually had willingness to pay conversations before they built anything. 
So they started to understand the different pieces in the cars, you know, that customers would be willing to pay for. So not just do you want this, right, which is already a bad question in itself, but would they, you know, they were trying to figure out how much people would pay for the different elements in the car before they built any kind of physical prototype. I found that very impressive, and that's public information, right? So willingness to pay conversations up front, that's, that's pretty exciting to see. Yeah. So um, a couple more things before we get into more Q&A. So uh, one, people keep asking me, well, is this just a list of experiments? And it's not. So um, I'm sharing some of the experiments with you today, but in addition to the field guide and the library aspect of the book, there's a lot around the book as well to help you make it kind of keep your momentum and uh, choose and theme and look at your organization. So uh, this is just a, a, a taste, right? So over the years, you know, we've kind of codified what are the kind of ceremonies, what are the meetings we need to uh, have to make this, uh, keep this momentum and make it repeatable. And so one thing is like planning. It's planning just like everything else. Um, you know, you're going to have to plan you're going to have to plan before you run off and your experiments. They're not just ad hoc experiments. So uh, as part of you keeping momentum, you know, schedule, you know, your planning sessions for, for your, your experimentation, just as you would your delivery. And then standups. I mean, standups are pretty core to most businesses now. And even if you're not doing them every day, I mean, we recommend every day. Um, they're also important for experiments. You know, each experiment, when you start breaking them down, even, even something like Wizard of Oz, you know, uh, the, the taste I gave you today, you have to assemble a team, you have to lay out all the, the steps, you have to get the marketing, the legal involved, you have to, um, you know, plan it all out. And all these tasks kind of roll up and it's work. So as you, you know, design these experiments and pull them together and run them, you should be tracking your work and helping each other, you know, as you do all the tasks for, for each experiment. So you need some kind of ceremony to, to help keep that on track. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's four or five weeks in and you're still at the beginning of your experiment design. Also learning, and, and that's a, a huge part of experimentation is it's not just doing them, but also what did you learn? So giving the space for the team to kind of come back and synthesize your evidence or, and, and get insights and help drive to action. You know, I think I keep hearing this in, in the market today of um, well, learning. We have to learn faster than everyone else. And that is true. But you also have to turn that learning into action faster than everyone else. So, you know, the market isn't going to reward you for just learning. Right? It's going to reward you for building something that's, you know, high value, that that's, you know, provides, um, it's, it's, you know, solves for a need or a job for the customer. And so, you know, learning is great, but you also have to make space to kind of really learn and really drive that to action. And well, then, let me just, um, let me just sure. share a small, a small um, anecdote there because um, let's have a, bit, a good laugh about strategizing as well. So I remember a couple of years back, um, you know, my co-author, Yves Binyar, who's not involved in the, in the business at Strategizer said, you know, you guys are great, but don't forget that, you know, it's not about learning. It's about action. It's about building a business. So we were doing a lot of learning, a lot of great experiments. And, and it's so easy to get caught up in, in experimentation and learning. At the end of the day, all you, you know, you really need to do is make progress from idea to business, which sounds like a trivial thing. But uh, often we kind of get caught up in learning. So I want to share this uh, silly kind of little story of failure at Strategizer of us learning too much and not acting enough. Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like over the last decade, we've kind of moved from fail fast to what well, you need to learn fast to what well, you need to learn about that into action fast, right? So it's not about failing, right? I mean, yeah, you're going to fail in experiments. That is the nature of the experiment. Some of them will fail. Uh, actually, some of them should fail and, and need to fail. But uh, it's not, you don't focus on the failure. I mean, failure feels, I mean, I, I, we have this uh, saying in the Valley, which is we need to embrace failure. And I'm like, ah, I don't know. I don't know if I need to embrace, like I'll give it a fist bump, you know, maybe, you know, acknowledge like a nod to failure, but I'm not embracing it, you know? So I need, so we need to move from that to a learning mindset. And then we need to take that learning mindset and kind of drive it into action. And that's where you're really going to see this payoff. And then, um, so also part of that is retrospectives. And again, this is pretty common um, in even Kaizen events for more kind of lean manufacturing companies. But basically, you know, take the time to figure out how we're going to get better at this. And so, you know, as part of this is kind of training, uh, like Eric Reese said, is training your intuition. And so, for example, you need to get better experimentation. And if you don't give yourself space to talk about what you need to do to get better, then you're not going to get better. And so the idea of, oh, well, we've we forgot the instrument analytics. Well, that's a big deal because you can't get the learning you need. What are some steps we could take next time to help you know, prevent that from happening? And then finally, you know, you need some kind of deciding, you know, decision maker 
um, session also with your stakeholders. So, you know, they feel very uncomfortable when team just goes away and starts running all these experiments. Um, you need to be able to kind of package up your learning and, pre and present it back. And, you know, if you're a startup, that's pretty much like, you know, when your VCs pretty, we should leave you alone. Right. And then you come back and say, this is what we've learned, you know, with our funding, et cetera. But if you're a corporation, you know, this is coming, um, you know, you're not pitching a VC, you're pitching a VP maybe. Right. So the idea of, you know, how do we package our learning, communicate upstream? Because there's this balance you have to act, you have to walk here with, we need to de-risk the business idea we're working on, but we also need to kind of teach people around us this new way of working and communicate how we're making progress. And I think the mistake I see with some teams is they get really excited about the process, right? And, and the process is interesting. I mean, obviously I'm passionate about it, but you know, your, your execs aren't gonna care about the process as much, they're gonna care about the results. And so you need to be able to kind of communicate, hey, these are, these are the hypotheses we had about our um, business idea. Here are the experiments we ran, here's the evidence we generated, this is what we learned from that evidence, and this is what we wanna try next. And if you can frame it, like you're helping them understand, wow, I, okay, help me understand why you chose that, you know, why, why you chose that recommendation. Uh, is there any other part of the business that can help you out on stuff that you're blocked on, right? So there is some really powerful stuff here with regards to not just doing the cycle once, you know, that's kind of like level one. We want to get you to like level two or three where you're doing this repeatedly. You know, maybe you have a portfolio of teams testing out business ideas and you're not just doing experiment once, you're doing this, you know, repeatedly over time and, and systematically de-risking your business ideas. So um, we're giving advice like this in the book too, where we're trying to lay out ceremonies for you and say, this is what we've seen over hundreds of teams across, you know, our experience. And this is what we think will work for you as far as you know, starting point. I want to emphasize two things here, because I think this is an extremely important kind of visual that you put up. And I see kind of mistakes in, in, in two of them. One is in the learning that teams fail to try to learn every week, look back at the experiment they do. And I like the way you often frame it with teams, one experiment a week, right? But that, that, that they try to learn at the end of the week. What did we, what are the insights we gained and how do we turn that into action? Meaning what do we need to change in our value proposition or business model, right? So that weekly learning and action is something that in particular in large corporations, less in startups, and I don't see that as regularly, right? They would go along four weeks and do some testing and then after four weeks, sometimes even worse, eight weeks, kind of start digesting and making decisions about their value propositions and business models. I want to emphasize that weekly cadence is extremely important in terms of learning and action. It's the first one I'd want to highlight. This, the, the second one is around deciding, right? I see many, many teams when they have these meetings with the key stakeholders, the decision makers, at the beginning when they're inexperienced, they fear presenting the evidence. They want to make the idea look as good as possible, but it's not about the idea. It's about the evidence, right? To say, here's what we learned and here's why we're confident we should be doing this. Here's what we don't know yet. Rather than saying, you know, the traditional way, oh, beautiful idea, beautiful spreadsheet and all that kind of BS. It does require, of course, that we help the leaders and we often need to train the leaders to look at the right thing. Not that they're looking at the shiny object. Oh, this is a great business model, you know, great business idea. It's very shiny as beautiful spreadsheet. No, they need to look at the evidence and help, help the teams evolve. So those two things I think are where we can make most progress still in corporations. Oh, I agree. And it happens even on small things like, um, like interviews, right? We'll do interviews, but then all the notes are strung out in Google Docs or pieces of paper or Word Docs, and and then we don't actually synthesize it, you know. And and if you don't do that, it's kind of dangerous because then you just pick out the things you liked you like to hear, right? To validate your own ideas, and then you run with them. So even something like as simple as interviews, taking the time, and we do this in the book. We teach you how to synthesize the results. And I think that um, it's just a practice we need to get in, involved in. There's a discipline to to testing that maybe. Um, isn't, isn't really uh, applied everywhere. So, so not only are we focusing on the library, but we're also focusing around the library of here are the ceremonies you need. Um, we go into leadership, we go into uh, org design a little bit too. We can't solve everything in one book, but I at least want to share what we've seen as patterns that can help you. Um, and then, you know, if you're reading this book and you have to convince your boss, right, you, you, you need something as far as making the case of, okay, well, we think there is a way we could do this and present progress and share what we've learned. So, um, I'll pause on this for a second because, you know, this is kind of the core of the book, but um, 
what other questions do we have? I guess Lauren from the group, or if Alex, if you have any other questions or comments. I think Lauren has a couple lined up, right? We don't. The time flies. We're fifty minutes in already, right? Um, really, really fast. Lauren, what, what what are one or two questions you'd like to highlight? David, a bunch of people are asking, you know, there's a whole industry around market research and a lot of large companies spend a lot of money on that market research. How would you weight the value of market research versus the evidence you'd get um, from testing? Yeah, I think there's still value in market research. Um, what I'm seeing is taking that expertise and trying to customize it and shape it in a way where, look, we need to do market research, but we need to do it quickly. So I see much more of an emphasis on speed nowadays. And so I have some corporations that are still partnering with their market research firms, but they're just the nature of the partnership is a little different. They're saying, look, we need to learn this by next week. I mean, we can't wait three months to, to kind of create a focus group and, and recruit people and perform it and record it and create these high fidelity kind of learnings. We, we want to learn fast. And, and there is a trade off there. Um, I think there's also somewhat of a danger of outsourcing all your research in the sense of um, one, it has an expiration date. So if you're building all your research off something you paid for a couple of years ago, uh, things have changed probably since then, depending on your industry. Um, even insurance, right? I was just meeting with insurance companies this week and their, their, their world has changed even in the last few years. And so research reports that they have, yeah, that was interesting learning at the time, but it's not really actionable today. Um, so I'm not discounting or discrediting um, market, traditional market research. I do think there's a need for that, but I do think uh, teams are prioritizing speed over over everything and so if we can just generate stronger strength of evidence over time through research and generate our own evidence we're just going to feel more confident about that if we have some at least guidelines on how to do it so even in your own organization you may have researchers that just tap into them you know they're the experts right and and you can help them understand well here's what we're trying to do at the pace we're trying to do and what can you provide so you do have to balance kind of traditional methods that might be a little slower to we have to go faster because if we take a really slow approach to this, you know, by the time it's even generated, it might be outdated in, in some, in some of these industries. I would, I would build right exactly right on top of that and say in, in particular in the early stages where you need to make fast decisions, it makes absolutely no sense to outsource this nor internally nor externally, because you're the one who makes the like, very rapid decisions. You don't want to have some kind of four week market study that's going to cost you in terms of time internally or a lot of bucks, a lot of money externally. In the early stages, you need to be in the driving seat, right? Steve Lank even likes to say, you need to see the pupils dilate of the people you're talking to, right? I wouldn't go maybe as far. But then in the later stages, I think it does make sense. You know, when you already reduced uncertainty a lot and you're, you're pretty you know, confident that you're going into the right direction, you could hire an agency or maybe the internal team to do a bit of a larger study that could take a bit more time, you know, two, three weeks. But you definitely don't want to do that in your first sprints, right? The first eight weeks, probably I'd say to three months, you should really be doing this yourself and rolling up the sleeves because you're the one who are making the decisions. You need to see that learning and, and sense, you know, in which direction you should do this. Imagine a startup outsourcing their customer research uh, no VC would ever fund them, right? So this shouldn't be the case internally either. Any other questions, Lauren, that came up uh, that you want to highlight? David, I think you've been talking about the strength of evidence. And here on this list of experiments, you, um, you can show the relative ranking of evidence strength. But I was wondering if there's an overarching way to kind of define what is strong evidence and what is not. Right, yeah. So here, um, maybe getting a little more detailed, we have to be mindful of our time, but basically, there are variants of strength, right? So weak is, um, again, it's kind of closing the say-do gap. So if there's, um, if it's verbal, qualitative, right, it's generally weak sense of evidence. And if there's a transaction or something that's more quantitative, it's usually stronger. Um, so qual and quant is one way to look at it. Another thing that we've done, uh, we understand that it's not just a one-shot thing. So if you look at some of the circles here, you'll notice they're outlined. Uh, we even learned as we go through, you know, experiments that some aspects of, the, the, the way you run it can generate weak or generate strong. So there's kind of a range and variation thereof. So uh, we address that in, um, uh, in, in the spreads in each experiment. I don't know if Alex, you wanted to expand on that at all. No, I think you, you did an excellent job. I, what I'm amazed is how fast these 55 minutes uh, went through. <laughs> we, we were hardly able to you know, go to, through, through all the content of the book. I think this, this has been brilliant. 
And um, I'll hand it over to uh, Lauren to wrap it up. I already want to say thank you, David, for this webinar. And thank you for actually, you know, um, um, joining us for writing this book. It's been an absolute pleasure. I want to be very clear. <laughs> David has done the heavy lifting on this. I tried to infuse some of the knowledge that we have. But this has been a brilliant, brilliant collaboration together. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Thank you, David. Thank you, Alex. This is a great webinar. And thank you all the participants who had um, some really great questions and interactivity. As you can see on the screen, um, we're coming out with another book. But first off, David's book, Testing Business Ideas, will be coming out in late fall, around November. If you want any more information on that, I posted a link in the chat and also on the Strategizer webpage, there's information. And then Alex and team are writing another book called The Invincible Company, which is basically about tools about um, invincible companies that have reinvented themselves and how they've reinvented themselves over time. And again, Strategizer will be posting this um, recording of this webinar. We'll be answering more of your questions on the blog. If you have any more questions about Strategizer itself, please have a look at our website. And thank you so much again.